Здравствуйте. Hello. You know, it's been a while since I spoke uh, Russian, so I'm not gonna speak Russian because it would be more fun than than pleasure for you. So, so uh, you know, I, I remember a couple of words because you know I had to learn Russian when I was at school. So it took me, you know, six years before I, you know, I encouraged my my teacher that I'm not that I was not aimed to to learn Russian. So you know, and, and it, it, it's been a while since I was in primary school. So you know, so so I forgot. And then I realized that I might, you know, learn, uh, you know, English because English is also uh, quite popular here. So I can speak uh, English here and other countries. So so it became my 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 uh, presentation language for 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 now. Okay, so Scala. Scala is another language. So. So think about it. How many languages can you speak? You know, Java, perhaps Scala, perhaps Closure, perhaps German, perhaps uh, Ukrainian, Russian, Polish, and many other languages. So we are we are in a really good position to learn yet another programming language if Scala is not your your language uh, for the moment. And if it is, I believe Scala object-oriented Scala is, is, is your primary, uh, primary language or prim primary flavor. Object orientation in, in Scala is your primary flavor, how you use Scala rather than functional, which I'm going to present today. So today's presentation is about functional aspect of uh, programming in Scala. Scala is a, is a hybrid, uh, functional, uh, hybrid programming language. So it blends two, uh, two uh, approaches to how we can program applications. Object orientation plus functional uh, paradigm, paradigm. So welcome. So, uh, so welcome to my talk. I'm Jacek Laskowski. I work for IBM as a technical uh, IT specialist. And I'm responsible for IBM WebSphere product family and there is a Java E application server and, and a couple of more. Uh, I, I'm quite active on Twitter, so I encourage you to use or uh, you know, yeah, invite you to, to follow me if you think uh, it might be worthwhile for your career. So let me start with a book that influenced my, my thinking about functional programming in Scala. This is the book that's uh, to be published by Manning. It's still in the uh, Manning Early Access Program. So you need to pay for this draft book or this book in draft. It's not yet published. So, so it's, it should be available in, in a couple of months, I believe, or perhaps weeks, because it's almost finished. Uh, all the chapters are available, but not for, for public consumption, only for, for reviewers. So, so I, I got this, uh, this book and it was really crazy book. And it brought me to Scala because previously I worked with Clojure and Clojure was my first functional programming language uh, and it was my first programming language on JVM. For the, for the pre uh, past 15, almost 15 years, I've been working with uh, Java only, and I thought that object orientation is the only way to, to see uh, world. And then came Clojure and, and showed me that uh, you know, there is also a functional aspect of designing, developing uh, applications. And that, that's how my journey into functional programming began. <laughs> and first it was with Clojure. Clojure was a uh, complete departure from, from, from what I learned uh, with Java or in Java, uh, then I saw that uh, Clojure is not that lang it's not very fancy language for, for many. So I decided to switch my my uh, my learning activities to to Scala because I saw that many people uh, consider Scala as the the next language for for you know for uh, for development. So I thought. I thought about learning Scala as a way to influence people to think functionally rather than object-oriented way, you know, object-oriented way. So that, that was my aim at learning Scala. Nothing else. Uh, I after after a couple of days, I realized that Scala is pretty powerful, so I learned more than uh, you know functional programming on JVM. But we'll get to it. So. 
And a, a word of warning, it's not a book about Scala. Scala is a vehicle to drive you towards <coughs> functional programming. So the main aim of this book is to introduce you to functional programming uh, as a paradigm uh, rather than to Scala. So, so some knowledge about Scala is required before I understand this book. There's another book written by Bruce Eckel, which I received when I was uh, at uh, Geekon, and it's, it's pretty fundamental in a way to learn Scala. Uh, there is nothing about, there is not much about functional uh, programming. There is not much about object-oriented programming, although Scala is mainly about object orientation for, for many. So the, the aim of this book is to show the, 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 the beauty of Scala in, in, a, in an easy and, and understandable way. So, okay, and there is another way to learn uh, functional programming in Scala. There is a Coursera course uh, that, that's uh, driven or run by Martin Odersky, who is the author of this language. So, so you can learn this language by its own uh, creator, its, its own uh, author, Martin Odersky. So, so I, I strongly advise you or recommend this, this course as a way to uh, enter this uh, functional scene because it's, it's very uh, entertaining one. So what's functional programming? Who is developing application in Scala? Five, five or six? Six people. Okay, six people. Uh, what about functional aspect of, of Scala? Do you use it? One, two, three, four, five. Come on, guys. I couldn't receive more responses to my question about functional aspect of Scala when I ask about, uh, you know, then, then what I've got asking about Scala in general, right? So when I got this uh, seven responses about functional aspect of Scala, okay, let me ask you another question. So what do you mean by using, or what do you think about Scala as a functional programming language? What it is to, to program functionally in Scala? Who's gonna answer this question? It could be in Russian. I can understand it. But it isn't. Okay. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, is he answering my question? Is, didn't he say that it's to migrate you from object orientation to functional uh, paradigm? Yes. Was this? That was not my main question. My question is, what it is to program functionally in Scala? It's about immutability, but also about your functions outside the text. The answer is, it's all about functions. Yes. Nothing else, nothing more, just functions. What about object orientation in Scala? What's the main goal of uh, developing application? Oh, main, not, not main goal. What's the what, what do you need to create or develop in Scala to call your program object-oriented one? You need to have a bunch of classes because object orientation is all about developing your own classes or using classes. Perhaps the, the, the formal answer is, is much better. So functional programming is by Wikipedia. In computer science, functional programming is a programming paradigm Okay, so it's a programming paradigm that treats computation, something you need to compute, as the evaluation of mathematical, forget about it, evaluation of functions. <laughs> so functions. Functions is the main goal or the main concern you'll be dealing with while programming functional. And then, what others said, Avoid state and mutable, mutable data. So all you've got is or are immutable data, stable data, and no side effects or no state. And think about it. If there is no state, how can you develop anything if you can't manipulate state in some way? It's nearly impossible. So. So this is, the, this is the definition by Wikipedia.
Wikipedia. But Scala allows you to manipulate state as you would do it in object-oriented uh, programming language, but gives you a way to uh, use functional programming uh, construct to construct your program. So although it is, you know, I, I didn't underline it because uh, avoiding uh, state is one way to develop programs, but uh, it, you know, in effect, or eventually, you will have to, you know, manipulate some state. So let me put it another way. So what's a functional programming? So it's a programming paradigm. What are the other paradigms you might know about? No, object oriented, object -oriented. Uh, it's, a, it's an approach. Imperative. Imperative and, imperative and logic. logic. So logic programming, imperative programming, and functional programming, all declarative programming being the, the higher in the hierarchy. But in general, we object orientation, object oriented programming is not a paradigm. It's a way to construct your world in, in your program. You can create objects using functions. Or you can mimic how objects behave using, uh, using functions, and vice versa. That's Scala. So, computation. What's computation? It's just a function evaluation. So you create a function and you evaluate it. You know what function is. You learn it during your math classes. So you know what that there is some input parameters and there are uh, output parameters. Or there is an input and an output. That's it. So when I, when I ask you, what's the square of 2? You know the answer. It's 4. And I ask you, what about side effects? Are there any? No. No. Why? Don't we need them? We don't need them for this simple computation. And functional programming is all about creating such simple functions and then combine them to create more powerful functions and that eventually end up as, as a program. Because after all, computation might be as, as small as a function, but it might be as big as, as a program, whatever you are, are, um, I'm relying on, on, on your imagination. So yeah, functional programming avoids state and mutable data, but it doesn't say it doesn't have uh, a way to mutate or you know manipulate state. So you don't have to worry about you know expressing yourself uh, using Scala uh, with what you learned from from Java. And function composition. Function composition is a way to create a program. Uh, so so you combine uh, functions to create programs. And what's more important, everything in Scala is an expression. Everything. So, what is an expression? We'll get to it soon. So, this is another definition of Scala. This is a definition by uh, the uh, website of Scala. So, look at this. It's written by the author and the team behind Scala. So, it's a multi paradigm programming language. Okay, we are fine with this. Integrates features of object-oriented. Okay, that's fine. But for, for the moment, we are mostly concerned with functional aspect of uh, programming in Scala. So there are features in Scala that are functional. So, so what I need you to remember is that every function, every function, is a value. What does it mean? What are the values you know? No, it's different. It's transparency, it's reference it. transparency. Exactly. You know what five is? It's a value. What about piatnica? What is this? What is this? What's, what's the type of this? String. String. It's a string. All day of week. Right. So there is a value. Could you imagine to have piatnica become subota? Sure, that'd be fine. But then you would need Piatnica, and whenever you are on. Uh, how is Monday? Pani Dzielnik, Tornik, Sreda, Cietwiar. 
Четвер? Окей, четвер. So whenever you hit четвер, четвер или четвер? Четвер. So whenever you are on in uh, or on uh, Thursday, you would uh, you would end up on Saturday. Well, it's crazy, right? So you miss your Friday. So so you need Friday, and you need to have this Friday to be stable. So whenever you see Friday, Friday is Friday. It's a party day. Saturday as well. Uh, Sunday as well, and the entire week. So. Whenever you see a value, you know that its value is fixed, it's stable, so it's immutable. Same for function. Function is a value. It's not so. So I, I should have asked about it. Have you programmed in a programming language that has this feature of having every function to be a value? JavaScript. JavaScript. Okay. Okay. So is JavaScript functional programming language? Yeah, it is. In some way, it is. Yeah. What about other languages? So C++. JavaScript? C++. C++. Yes. <laughs> what is C++? Okay. So it has references to functions. Okay. So, so references. Okay. So is a reference a value? Okay. It's a good question. I cannot answer this question. Okay. So let me move on. So because we are trying, you know, we are looking for for languages I'm not prepared for. So, uh, what about this? What is this? Function. It's a function. How did you know it? Did you program in Scala? Because in every input you will have the same uh, result. No, it's not a definition of function. So, this is a function in Scala. This is your very first function in Scala. It's absolute value of n. And you know it. You know the answer. What's the type of n? integer or number, right? Could you have um, this function uh, to be applied to string values? Yes. Why not? Okay. Let me try it. One second, please. Uh, the problem is I should. Uh, it depends on, on the context where this function is situated. For example, if it's object, it will be a function. But in case of class, it will be method. Yes, we'll get to it soon. So, this is a Scala REPL. If you, if you want to uh, play with Scala, you will use something which is called REPL. We'll get to it soon. But, you know, for the moment, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some, some Scala code because, you know, people ask, keep asking me about it. You know, just show me some code because that's the aim of, of your presentation. Although, even though my, my description might be different. But for the moment, okay, so this is a scalp. So 2 plus 2, we know what it, what's the result, right? Is it 5? Yeah. How did you know that? Yes. If you replace. Yes, that's the proper answer. How could you, how could you insist on plus uh, to have a behavior you imagined? It's my, it's my class, so I could redefine it, whatever, and, and you know, create a, a definition, um, you know, to, to suit my, my needs. So yes, two, two plus two is four. What about this def uh, plus uh, int, uh, int. Is it proper? Is it proper? Proper definition? Yeah. Yes. It, it's been compiled. It, it was compiled. It was compiled properly. So I define a function, function called plus. So I can apply it to it's six. OK, so I, I'm not going to you know, uh, change it to, to behave in a way, in, in a infix way. But, uh, you know, it all depends on the definition. So, this is the way to define functions. So, def, name, and input parameters. What about output parameter? What's the type? I didn't define it. So, it's, it is defined. It is defined. It's definitely defined. 
because we can see it here. It's integer. How did Scala know about it? The compiler, the compiler inferred from the input parameters and from the operations on them. So it figured out, the compiler figured out that the return value has to be int because there is no other way to, 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 you know, to end up or to have a type for this expression. Well, there might be a, you know, another type, but you know, what about this? Let me let me redefine this. All right. Let me redefine it and let's have this. Okay. Would that compile? Plus m. Okay. And plus m plus two. Would that compile? Yes. yes. <laughs> Who is for yes? yes. Uh, okay, Harsha. Uh, what about no? Mm, okay, guys. Okay. <coughs> Look at this. It doesn't compile. It could, but Scala doesn't allow such such weird constructs. It could, but it doesn't. That's it. We need to learn that some some stuff we could accept are not acceptable for for Scala. Okay, that's all for, for, for the moment. Let's go back to, to the presentation. So, where's the presentation? Okay, so so this is the, the this is a definition of ADS absolute value of n. So I gave integer as the return value, but it's not necessary. So, the very first def is keyword to define a function. Then comes, oh, I should use this. Then comes method name, then input parameters with types, with the types, a optional return type, sometimes it is necessary, sometimes it's not, it depends on the context, and then methods body, body. So, can you read it? Can you understand this, this, this short piece of uh, code? I'm sure you do. You can. So, what about this? Expression versus statement. What's the difference? Who's going to answer this question? Is there any difference? Yeah. And the expressions uh, always return some result. Yes, it's all about result. And about side effect and potential side effects. So, an ex a statement changes changes a state, manipulates state. So it's called mainly for side effects. What side effect? Side effect is something that you wouldn't figure out looking at signature of a function. So whenever you see a function you see input and output parameters, right? Can you know, can you find out if there is something else, some other state is manipulated looking at the signature? No. You need to look inside this function's body to figure it out. While an expression always produces a result and could have some side effects. So, give me uh, some examples of expressions and, and statements in any language you speak. So, what about statement? What's a statement? Print. Center. Yes, print. Print is print or printun in Java in JavaScript are examples of statements. What's the result of the of the execution? Void. Well, and some side effects. You manipulate the state of your console. What about an expression? It's Give me some. Functions, functions of the on the previous slide. Exactly. ABS, absolute value of n, was pure function without side effects. It was an expression because it gives you a result, a value of a given type. So, remember this. Everything in Scala, everything that's, that's correct, that's compilable, is an expression. Everything. Whatever you type in, 
and is acceptable by the compiler, it is an uh, expression. No statements. No. So you cannot have a function without a return value. You cannot. Yes? For example, uh, the statement uh, could change a global variable. Yes. It's a setter. That's, that's more closer to side effects. Yeah. Because it's pretty common in object-oriented programming. <coughs> where, where you have, where you encapsulate a state, you keep it under the covers of an object, and you manipulate it using, you know, different setters, uh, setter-like methods. Okay. So, is this an expression? Yes. Okay. Yes, it is an expression. So this is an absolute uh, function. It's a, a function of n that returns n, uh, that returns an integer. So yes, is this an expression? Yes. So think about it. So in the previous example, we've got two expressions, right? One we define and one that is defined. Exactly. So we use if as an expression in another expression that's a function. So think about it. Is there any language you've been developing with that has if as a, an expression? As far as I know, CoffeeScript. Okay, what about Java? Is if an expression or a statement? statement. It's a statement. What about other programming language? What about C++? If, is it a... An um, expression or neither? Neither. Definition of function? No. I'm asking about if in C++ is it is it an expression or is it a statement? Statement. Statement. Yes. So think about it. An expression has to have a type. It has to has has to have a type because it gives you a result of its execution. So what's the type of if? in this example. Integer. Right. It's an integer. It's of integer type. Okay. So, uh, what's the type of this? An integer. Right. right. The first time type of N. Exactly. That's the, that's the proper answer. It depends on the <coughs> type of N. If N is of type string, would that work? Oh, yes. Why? Why oh, wait, 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 wait. Yes, no? no Good. So let me ask the question. Let me ask the question. Let me let me run a poll. So, so who is for yes? So who is... The question was, could n be of string type? This depends on context. Yeah, I know. What's the answer? So are you for yes or for no? Add increases and it will uh, be compiled. In this case, it will not compile because we are using comparison with integer. How, how do you know if I if I because if I don't use any you know construct like implicit? Because zero is integer. Ah, in, in case so of reflex, maybe. <laughs> so the answer is we don't know. Comparison. We don't know. We don't know. That's it. Compiler will know, and if compiler doesn't, he will ask us for types. So. Start programming. Start your programming. Start your programming journey in Scala without types, without worrying about type, about worrying about types, because they are not necessary for functional programming in general. When compiler insists on having a type or types, you will add it, and you will you will figure it out using the, the, the error message from from the compiler. So don't worry about it. So what's this? It's a function. Function definition. Function definition? Wow, good. Try again. So, what's the opposite of Harsha? Plocha. It's an expression. You said every single expression. Yeah, sure. But is it an expression? Yes. No. It's a functional type. Yes. That's the type. That's a functional, that's the functional type. That's the way to define a function type in Scala. So this racket, it's called racket, is, is to say, so what's the 
And now, I'm pretty sure you understand the, the, the construct. You know, what's it? This part, this, this type, why do I need it? Why is it for? It's a type to enter input parameters. Exactly. This is for input parameters. What's this is, what, is, what is this for? Result. So, whenever you see such, an con such uh, this construct, this construct, you will understand now that this is a function type. For, this is the type for input parameters, this is the type for output parameters. That's good. So, this is a function type. Okay, let's have some fun and let's run some, some more questions or some polls and have some examples of, of uh, functional type or function types. So, what does this function do? What does this function do? Into stream. <laughs> How did you know that? <laughs> no, it depends on uh, it depends on implementation. It depends, but in functional programming, in functional programming, you can say a lot about function looking at function signature. You have a contract in this case. Exactly, that's the contract. In Java, in any other object-oriented or non-functional uh, programming languages, you wouldn't say much about this function. Well, we could, we could assume that Java, uh, you know, or Java programmer program uh, his or her uh, applications using functional um, thinking. But in Java, it's it's not very common to say, okay, give me the signature, and I, I'm gonna tell what this function does. It's very rarely. Uh, it it's, it happens very rarely. In functional programming, especially in in purely uh, in, in, in its pure aspect, whenever you see a signature such like this, su such uh, signature like this, you can say it's to transform integer to string, so it's probably to string. No, it's lookup. It's a picture. Yes, it could be a lookup. But you know, the, 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 the set of problems you can uh, you can address with this uh, type signature, uh, function type signature, is, is pretty, uh, is, is known. Also, this means that it will not have any side effect. It no, it doesn't. It uh, least it's not about side effects. Okay, what about this type? It's tuple. It's tuple. It's <laughs> well, forget about tuples. You know, I'm asking about yeah. what, what does this function do? Any binary operation. Any binary operation. Okay, it's any binary operation. Good. Plus Good. Oh yeah. What about oh, casting? I mean, do you do you know? Do you happen to know from your math studies or lessons that you can you know say okay I've got this uh, pair and I'm gonna ha create a function that will cast on first or second element. So it's a, it's it's called uh, it has a special name in math uh, I can't remember now but yeah it's a binary operation definitely because oh no it's not actually no it's not because it accepts just one parameter okay anyway let's move on it doesn't even matter for, for the moment if we fully understand the the, the types uh, or not you know it's it just to you know make you more familiar or, or you know bring this to table just to you know get you up to speed with uh, understanding programs other others might write what about this what is this current yeah forget about it <laughs> you impressed me so much <laughs> this is a function that uh, receive in parameter and return functions that receive in parameter and return in yes have a shot <laughs> so uh, yes he's right it's a function it's a function that returns another function because of this that, that accepts an integer and return and returns an integer. Okay, that's good. Thank you. What about this? It's a function accept a function. Yes, that's that simple. So, so these two examples 
are to, show, are to say that we are able to pass functions as input parameters and we can create new functions out of existing values of functions. Okay, so Scala app, you have seen it, but let's define some, some methods. So let me mirror my display. Okay, so, so let's create a function that will accept, so let's create uh, a function that will accept in, uh, that will accept string and return int. So, what could we do in this? Parse. In this? Parse. Sorry? Parse. parse. Yeah, parse. What about this? <laughs> Would it work? <laughs> yeah. What is this? It's a joke. It's a magic number. Yeah, it's a magic number. But, you know, whenever I call ABS with any string, I get one. Yeah, that's obvious. So don't do this, because it's not obvious looking at, at the signature. So, okay, let's do this again. So, you see, you can, you can move uh, up and down uh, through the history of REPL, uh, and it's, it's very useful. In functional programming, uh, w whenever you, you see a functional developer, he will use something like REPL. So Clojure has a REPL, Scala has a REPL, and other functional uh, or functional like languages has their own, um, have their own uh, REPLs, because it speeds up uh, the development process a lot. So it helps to you know, create programs in, in parts. So you can create your function, then you can combine this function with another function, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, what about this? What am I going to write? A function called ABS. It's a weird name for, for this function, but we can, we can create something, you know, uh, entertaining. So ABS accept S as an input parameter, right? And returns a function that accepts int and returns int. So let's create a function that accepts int. Yep. Well, uh, let me do this. <laughs> ah, no. Uh, to int? Is it something like this? I don't know. What would it be? That's weird. Don't develop uh, applications like this or using such functions. Because it's to, you know, ignore uh, the parameter of, of the uh, second uh, function and return s transform to int. So let's call it type mismatch. Good. What about this? Good. What's this? You received the function. Yes. I received a value because I called an expression, so I got a function because that's what the signature told me. So, so how can I call this a this function? Restful. Yes, I can use this restful. How did he know that? Because restful is of type in is of, of functional type int to int, and it's a function. So, so what Scala did was to create or initialize a value called rest form to be a function. Function that accepts one parameter, an int. You can see it here. Is this, is this a pointer? This red? Okay, I'm gonna press it. <laughs> ready? Okay. Boom. Well, yeah, it works. So, rest form is a function. You can see it here. So, let's call rest form. Yeah, it does work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's value. It's a value, like 5. 5 is a value of int. It's, a, it's of type int, like rest 4, which is a function. Okay, so let's go. How, how can I call?
call rest call. Just like any other function. Okay? Just like this. No. no. <laughs> Why? It's yeah, it's parameter. How did I know that? Or how did you know that? Because I, I know it from its signature. So so let me call it and rest four. Five. That's that simple. How could he how could it calculate five out of three? Well, that's the definition of the function. I'm not gonna use it anymore. Okay, so let's define another function. So another that accept uh, that accepts a function of this function do? Execute. Yeah, just execute. Always parameter. Yeah. So what parameter do you have? You have five. Five, okay. That's it. It works. But is it useful? Not much. It yes, it compiles. But in, in Scala, whatever compiles is almost to be runnable, meaning that you can claim your program runs properly because of uh, Scala's compiler to be picky for things that, that would have otherwise uh, you know, come up at runtime in, in languages like Clojure, perhaps, or other dynamic languages. It's a uh, statically typed, so, so everything has a type. So, so let's call another. So how can I call a method with that that accepts int and return int. Rest false. Well, let's call it this way. Uh, so okay. Does this work? What is that for? It's fine. Good question. Thank you for asking. How much time do we have? How much time? Five minutes. Good. So now. I'm gonna switch to slide. Okay, so you've seen REPL. Collections in Scala, there are vectors, sets, maps, and range, and you can use them as, uh, you know, because they are, they are available, and I'm gonna, you know, uh, I'm gonna uh, use them in a moment, but I'm heading to, towards your, your question, or uh, one answer to your question. So we've got map, filter, and reduce. Okay, it's fine. And your question was about function literal. So anonymous function. So, or more about this underscore, which is a wild card. So, what does this function do? Checks. Filter. We've got only five minutes. You need, to be, you need to be in a hurry. It filters a string yeah. as list of characters on the characters that have in value higher than 100. Which ask you call this? More? Yes. Pretty much this. So, Jacek, J-A-C-E-K, is a string. But it's an iterable string, meaning you can see it as a collection of characters. So, filter is a function, higher order function meaning it accepts another function. And that's the way to define a function. Anonymous function without a name. So what's the type of this function? It accepts C. What's the type of C? Yeah, yeah. Character. Because compiler could infer it out of the, the input parameter of filter. So C is of type character. And what does this re uh, return? Another character, but filter will filter out all the characters that are less than 100. It returns boolean in this case. Yes. In this case, it returns a boolean because that's what filter ex uh, expects. But with this filter, this co construct will return all the characters that has it, their integer representation more than 100. Imagine how would you develop it in, in your own programming language? <coughs> Perhaps in Java. Well, you could, using Guava. There was I, 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 in Java. So, sorry? I'd like to 
Java yeah, or Java or use Java eight. Can you use it? <laughs> In production? <laughs> yeah. Well I can't use Scala in production. Can't you use Scala in production? No, I need to convince my boss. Oh, well, so is, well so same so for your salary price. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. What about this? That was the question. And that's that's to answer this question. So what does this do? Same as, same. same as this. So the answer for your question, what does this underscore mean is it means the very first input parameter to this function, anonymous function. Because we declare that this input parameter is called C and we use it here, but do we really need it? So we can use underscore. This is only in terms of functions with one per input parameter? No. Uh, the more, the, uh, more underscores means more input parameters. <laughs> so, one, one underscore means only one input parameter. First. Sorry? First, one. Only one. Only one. Two underscores means mean or means, yeah, mean two input parameters. But, but when you use inside the body function, uh, how do you distinguish between first parameter and second parameter? That's what uh, my, my, my friend with uh, first row said. Order matters, meaning first occurrence of underscore means first input parameter. <laughs> second means second input parameter, and, and on and on. It's not very complicated. It's perhaps me. And this is another way to express this function. Instead of curly braces, you can use round braces. It doesn't really matter. But it's all about functional interval. OK, in function composition. Last slide. So we can apply a function map to a sequence. We can apply map to a sequence and execute to uppercase. What does this function do? What does this combination of functions do? Yeah. Will it work? Yes. No. <laughs> Why? Because two uppercase doesn't exist or it's not yet defined. So I want to receive a compila compilation error. So I define it. So whenever I receive C of type char, car, I will stringify it and use two uppercase. Perhaps there are other ways, but I'm not good at Scala. So two uppercase on C gives you uppercase of, of this, this input parameter. And then we can use, since this is a, an expression, we don't have to you know, define two uppercase. We can use this as part of this anonymous function. So there are many ways to express same meaning. And it's up to you, up to your style, to use whatever uh, approach you use. But what result of the function? Because you, uh, I think there is a Yes. So it will not be a string in result, a list of strings. Yes. That's the that's the that's how map works. Map will always return a, 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 a type collection Context. from from input parameter. Yeah. If two uppercase return character, we will receive a string, or we would receive a collection of characters. May I use some time to explain it? Two minutes. Okay. So what was the, the question? The question if two upper string would return. Yeah, OK. So uh, Kiev, Kiev map, what does map uh, needs? It needs, uh, well, let me write it this way. It needs a function, OK? So we can define a function of one parameter, okay. one parameter. And this parameter is of, we'll see. It won't work. Why? Because. Because you need to return something. Yeah, right. So let me write this. Is it uh, acceptable? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> because you need to return the file. Okay, that's good. Is it? 
Okay, but it, it's not the point of, you know, making it uh, more complex. So, so the type of this function is, uh, of, of this function I'm, I'm going to create is character. And this character will get, you know, uh, will be the, res the response. So, map will use this data structure, it's a, it's a collection, to create another collection with these elements. So, actually we can, we can map to another type, we can map to int, for example, yes? That's why we have to define it. Yes. We have to define the output, uh, uh, type of a new map. Oh, uh, not wind or what? Sorry, maybe what? Okay. Yeah. So this one will give you a collection vector of one because that's the length of every character you receive as an input parameter. Okay, it's getting more complicated because you know. Uh, your questions are more complicated than I expected. So let me <laughs> start it. Stop it now with this slide. Are there any questions? Itania? How to use it in the real life? In real life? <laughs> Same question for any other uh, programming language. Who did you ask the question? Who asked the question? Okay. So, you know, same question applies to any other programming language. You can, you can express everything in Scala because it's too incomplete. So, Java, Scala, JavaScript, uh, JRuby, Ruby, Python, Groovy, well, Clojure are all same languages with different syntax. So, some problems are easier to be expressed using functional approach rather than object-oriented approach. In Java, whatever you want to describe in Java, you need to create a set of objects. While in Scala, in functional Scala, you will have to create a set of functions. And you compose them as you would compose objects. So objects are necessary to interact with the outer world. Exactly. In, in, in functional uh, paradigm, you create functions to talk to other functions to, to create uh, composable applications. Should I learn Scala or wait for Java 8? Use Scala because it's ava available already, and Scala 8, when, when Scala 8 will, you know, will appear, you may switch to Java 8. But uh, I'm, uh, I'm doubtful I'm when sure. it's going to happen. I'm not sure that you can compare them, actually. Yeah, sure, but because, you know. Because closures and function references in Java 8, it's not uh, uh, complete functional. Uh, sure. Function. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's that's another valid answer. So use Scala because it's already available. It's pretty pretty easy to use. You know there are some some synta syntactic uh, sure. uh, how to say not sure how many syntactic differences between uh, Scala and your uh, your current language. But after all. It's just a couple of you know days to, to get familiar with, with the syntax, and you can play with Scala pretty easily. In, in, uh, oh, play is one thing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, sure. Yeah. Many years ago, maybe I can show you a little bit of the That's the language I understand. Mikhail. Okay. Well, you know, I'm not a programmer, so I cannot say out of my experience, but I know that people are, you know, uh, are being paid by, by developing applications in Scala, and Scala is, is pretty useful as far as uh, combining JVM features with, uh, with um, problems that, that require MapReduce uh, approaches. So whenever you see a term called big data, I believe Scala is much better suited for, for such problems than, than Java. Although Java and Scala work uh, fine on JVM, and after all, Java and Scala are only generators of, uh, of bytecode. So, you know, it, it all depends on, 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 on 
I would say, on the problems you are aiming at. So, sorry.